So this evening, if you are uh, up to speed with your reading and the fruitful life, we're in chapter 10. We're looking at gentleness this evening. Gentleness. And um, I, I mentioned to somebody earlier today that, that I would be teaching this chapter. And said, oh yeah, what, what, what's that one on again? And I said, gentleness. They, they kind of laughed and then said, that's a, that's a good one for you. And I don't really know even now what that means, but... Uh, we're going to walk through this together. Um, gentleness, one of the things that I, I want to kind of occupy ourselves with, really with all of these, is we've walked through the fruitful life, but I have it kind of bookending us this evening. We're going to start here. We're going to end here. When we talk about these, these fruit of the Spirit, we're not talking about your natural disposition. We're, we're not talking about, uh, you know, a personality trait. Well, this is just what I'm like. It, this isn't something like that. Instead, it's, it's a character trait, which means it's rooted in our habitual action. But more than that, because it's a fruit of the Spirit, that means it is by necessity produced by the Lord in us, by our relationship with the Lord. It, it's the outflow of the work of God in our hearts, transforming us into the image of His Son. The only way that we are able to portray true godly gentleness it is because of God. You can have those in the world who are portraying some form of gentleness, a gentleness that even, even would be defined by them, but true godly gentleness, like we're going to look at this evening from the pages of Scripture, that only comes about as a result of our relationship to the Lord. And it's true for all of these character traits that we walk through. As we go through each of these, when we talk about patience, we're not just talking about somebody who can, who, who can put up with a lot for a little while. We're talking about somebody who is exhibiting a godly, God-produced patience that is inexplicable to an unbeliever. And the same is true for, for, for gentleness this evening. There's a great uh, quote given here at the beginning of the chapter on, on page 121, if you've got the book with you, um, where, where the author quotes uh, this pastor, George Bethune, where he says, Perhaps no grace is less prayed for or less cultivated than gentleness. Indeed, it is considered rather as belonging to natural disposition or external manners than as a Christian virtue. And seldom do we reflect that to not be gentle is sin. I, I, I want to remind us tonight, beloved, this, the lack of these fruits being demonstrated in our life ought not just be a, well, you know, it, it should alarm us. And more than that, when we are violating or acting in contradiction to these, we're not just, well, I know it's one of those things I need to work on. We're sinning. When we're not being, as the Bible would define gentleness, when we are not gentle, we're actually sinning. And what's more, this, this chapter opens, as it opens, it puts the finger on the pulse of this. To neglect this is to sin. Because again, this is a trait of God. We're going to look at that more fully in just a moment. This is a trait of God. It, it's, it's one of his character attributes. So, to reflect this is, is to reflect our relationship with God. All of these function as, as helpful barometers to how are we doing in our pursuit of godliness. Because I want us to remember this. This is so critical that we understand this from the outset. In all of these, this isn't just about making us a nicer, better person. We're not walking through the fruitful life so that you can just feel better or so that you can be a better citizen this is so that we can pursue and cultivate our likeness to Christ, specifically. All of these have as their ultimate example, their ultimate manifestation, the Lord. And so to depart from that pattern, to wander into, well, I, you know, that one's not really me. That's really kind of the problem. We want to grow away from, well, that's just not who I am, to this is who Christ is and I want to be like him. I want to imitate. I want to pursue. I want to follow after 
Christ. I, I want to, as dear children, be imitators of God, like the apostle writes in Ephesians chapter 5. We want to pursue maturity into the full mature image of Christ's likeness. That, that's our role as believers, is that we would put off our old self and put on the new man in the image of Christ. So, to me, this is, this is about sort of setting the stakes. This is reminding us that to just sort of look at this one, and, and I'll be really honest, in preparation for this, there's a, there, there's a natural disposition that I possess that goes, gentleness. Like, I, you know, I don't know. What does that mean? What does that look like? But it's critical because God said so. And to neglect the cultivation of this isn't just to miss out on being gentle and, and, and instead be harsh or, 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 you know, brutal or brusque. It, it's sin. Which is why we have to cultivate these. Because here, here's the constant tension with our sanctification. Our sanctification. While this is a work produced in us by our relationship to the Lord, it requires our labor also. It's, it's this continual synergistic work. God is laboring to produce this in us and we are laboring to work it out from the inside to our actions. It's the, we've been commanded to do this and enabled by the life of Christ in us. And now we have the responsibility of working that out in obedience, of making no provision for the flesh, of putting off those deeds, of putting to death the things that are earthly within us, and putting on, actively pursuing, and executing obedience to God. But the good news in that, because here's the thing, we'll get off balance if we land too heavily on one side or the other of that. If we land too heavily on, well, God is going to take care of it in me. He, he's going to produce these things within me, and so I don't have to worry about it. A, we're, we're demonstrating a tacit ignorance of the scriptures. Well, God's just going to do all this for me. No, because there's commands. This morning we had our, our, our men's study there in the back of the ministry house at 6 a.m., and one of the things that <clears throat> Pastor Philip hit on, one, one of the things that he mentioned was this reality of, Guys, there's work to do. The reason that we have commands in the Bible, there's no um, hypothetical commands. There's no superfluous extra excess commands in there just thinking, well, you know, I, this will never happen, but let me go ahead and tell them to do that. Rather, we have the commands that are in Scripture are there because we need them. And we're commanded to do things like pursue righteousness, pursue holiness, because... Naturally, we won't. Even for believers, we have a yearning, a longing that will eventually work its way to pursuing righteousness if we're believers, if indeed Christ dwells within you. However, if we land so hard on the, you've got to do this, you've got to try hard, do more. Without relating or connecting that to it is Christ who works in you, it just creates frustration. It creates a frustration of, you need to try hard, you need to do more, you need to work harder. I know that you messed up. Try again next time, in your own strength, in your own power, disconnected from your relationship to the Lord. Maybe you can white knuckle it for a while and do good if we don't ever connect it to our relationship to the Lord. So primarily, before we ever dive further into this chapter, before we ever dive further into gentleness, one of the things that we've really got to connect to is the reality of <clears throat> the labor that this entails, it, it will take work. But our energy for accomplishing, pursuing, doing this work comes from the Lord. And where in examination we come to any of these and we say, I, I'm struggling in this area. I'm struggling in patience. I'm struggling in faithfulness. I'm struggling in gentleness. Where we see these things, like Pastor Philip said this Sunday morning, where we see an absence of thankfulness, it's because there is some kind of unrighteousness there. Where we see a lack of gentleness, it's because there's some other sin choking that out. There's something 
gone haywire in our relationship with the Lord that enables us, that energizes us, that invigorates us to pursue likeness with him. So let's talk a little bit further on here in the subject of, of gentleness. Here the author goes on and says, perhaps this is the bottom of the first page there on page 121. It says, perhaps we don't value it as highly as God values it. Again, this is about setting the stakes. When we come to these, we have to remember the scriptural commands. And again, sort of piggybacking for those of you that were there this morning at the men's study. We cannot obey commands that we don't know. We cannot obey commands that we don't know. If we are not regularly looking to God's word to see what has the Lord told me to do, we're going to continually be frustrated with our spiritual growth. We're going to continually be like, I just don't know what's going on. What are you reading? What are you studying? What commands are you pursuing obedience in? Well, I, really, I really don't know. Therein lies the problem. So when we're made aware of a command like, we're to have the mind of Christ. We're to have our affections, our, our desire set on things above then we can say, well, I want, to, I want to desire the same things that God desires. I, I want to have the same mind, the same attitude, the same disposition as Christ. When we're reminded that we're to be conformed to the image of the Son, that we're to be transformed by the Word rather than conformed to the world, all, all of a sudden the stakes get raised on all of this. Gentleness isn't just something nice that we should be, be, be better at. It's, it's a command issued by our King. So we have to have the same valuation as the Lord and, and not the world. So we want to we go after these because of the, the reflection of the character of our Lord. So uh, just a few pages. We're going to jump around a little bit in this chapter. But in page 124, the author brings out a couple different texts in reference to this. He, he, he talks about, he mentions Matthew 12, 20, where Jesus is referenced in, in Matthew, really connecting it back to a prophecy in Isaiah a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not stuff out. Pastor Philip taught on this some time ago. Um, that's available on, on the website. If you go to cbcstuart.com and, and, and look up that text, look up that passage, you can find where Pastor Philip taught on that. But this was <clears throat> a, a way of describing the really radical gentleness that was displayed by our Lord that would be characteristic of the Messiah. That he would be one who, something that others would look at and see as valueless, he would not cast aside. The thing that others would look at and say, let's just, you know, it's a smoldering wick. It's, it's, the, it's the withered end of that. We're not going to do anything with it. Let's cut it off. Let's cast it out. It, it has little value. Instead, it finds value in the hands of our Lord. It's, it's not something that's just crushed and destroyed and thrown away. Rather, in the gentleness of Jesus, it's, it's received. And one of the beautiful realities of Scripture is that it's not just received, it's, it's remade. It's reformed into a useful thing in his hands. A little bit further on, the author mentions uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, uh, a text many of you probably have memorized or definitely heard some of you. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Why? For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is comfortable and my burden is light. Like, like, we get that with Jesus, right? The, the idea that Jesus in his gentility, in his gentleness, his consideration of our condition, he stoops to receive the burden of the law from our shoulders. He carries it on our behalf and then brings us home. One of the things, and I've referenced this a number of times throughout this year, one of the things that we're doing in, in the high school, well, really in all of the grades here at CCA, <clears throat> but in each of the homerooms in high school, that's where I lived. The elementary's doing their own thing. I, I, it's just, I don't, I don't go there. I don't know what they're doing. <clears throat> um, not, not the way that I do in my homeroom. Um, but in, in uh, 
the different homerooms, they're all memorizing different passages of scripture. Um, this Friday, by the way, this Friday at uh, 8.15, there's an elementary chapel and it's going to be a good one. It is going to be a good one because you're going to get to hear all of those elementary kids, K through 5, get up and recite massive portions of scripture. Um, and, and we do this periodically where we just say, hey, you should come to that if you're free, if you're available for it. You should come. You should be there. If you're available for it, come to the chapel this morning. I, I believe that we're going to be recording it, and we, we'll try to make that available later. But certainly, if you can be here for that and hear the elementary kids, get up and recite verse after verse after verse. If you can be here and hear some of these kids reciting, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. I haven't been to the elementary chapels in a while. Are any of them saying whole chapters? Yeah, several of them are saying whole chapters, if I'm not wrong. Um, in the high school, last chapel that we had, uh, just before the Thanksgiving break, we had two different homerooms, two different uh, grade brackets, saying more than an, a whole chapter from some of the epistles. And, and in my homeroom, we just finished a chapter. We're starting in Ephesians chapter 2. And, and we're taking you know, sort of small chunks and, and making sure one of the things that we're, we're laboring in is that they're not just sort of by rote memorizing this and being able to rattle it off, but they have no idea what it's saying. We're walking through these sections of scripture and saying, hey, this is what's going on in this text. This is what's going on in this verse. And we got to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, that, that, that deals with you were dead in your offenses and sins. You were following after the pattern of this world according to the prince of the power of the air. Those were the sons of disobedience. Then it gets down there to verse 3 and, and it's painting this dismal picture of how things were and it introduces this massive transition in verse 4 and I got to lead into that with my students today. With my ninth graders to say, now guys, this is what it's talking about. He's doing a retrospective. Here's what it had been. But, verse 4 is going to say, but God, being rich in love and the love wherewith he hath loved us, he sent his son to die for us. Guys, that's an expression of his gentleness. It's his great love and his compassion that moved him to save us. That God, in total unity as a trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are laboring together in our salvation. Please don't, there's, there's sort of a, a uh, distinct teaching that, that will sneak in every, every now and then, this idea that, and sometimes it's through, you know, uh, well-meaning songs or illustrations and things where it'll sort of portray God the Father sort of just had it out for justice, but Jesus steps in and decides he's gonna, he's gonna save everybody and almost has to strong arm God the Father to the floor. That's not the reality presented in Scripture. That's not the reality presented in the Bible. You see, if you want to look at this and see this in a wonderful way, turn with me real quick. This isn't anything in the notes. We're rabbit trailing. 1 Peter chapter 1. And I'm just going to read this and point a few things out and encourage you. View the incredible love and mercy and gentleness of our Lord in display of redemption. And the fact that this is an inter-Trinitarian work. Look with me here just at these first few verses. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. So, sometimes, by the way, and I think I mention this uh, fairly often. <clears throat> but sometimes there's these, these opening verses of epistles that we can kind of fly through. Especially if there's hard to pronounce words. And, and we just, we miss, there's treasures in there. But look with me at 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who were chosen, verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Do, do we see the full Trinitarian reference there? And that's not the only place. This happens frequently throughout the epistles, but even just keep reading. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for us, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And, and, and if we work intertextually, if we go to other places to talk about how are we preserved, how are we kept for that inheritance, places like Ephesians chapter 1 will tell you we're kept by the Spirit of God who's given us a seal of our, our inheritance, the pledge of our redemption. There's so much wonderful truth that we can, we can be reminded of, and, and here's where we're going to turn it back to gentleness, because in this, the Lord's gentleness to our being dead in our trespasses and sins is revealed. That he considered our frame, he considered our condition, humbled himself, and took action. He, he took action. One of the things we're going to look at in just a minute is that gentleness is humility and compassion in action. Because somebody who's gentle is reflecting this condescending nature of Christ. They're one who is considering the condition of another and acting in light of that. Hopefully you, you've all heard the, the point made that, you know, the, the, the Jesus that you sometimes see in stained glass or in paintings or, or things like that, that, you know, very nicely done hair and very gentle looking person in his face and carrying a lamb on his shoulders, that's not an accurate representation of Jesus. It's misleading because it only shows one dynamic. We need to be able to take the full Christ. That, and and we, we, especially I think around here, we, we appreciate, yes, this is Jesus who tossed tables in the temple, who, who fashioned a whip and drove men and animals from his presence because of their misdealings in his father's house. He, he's, he, was a, he was a carpenter. He was a hard laborer. He, he endured tremendous suffering in silence. Yet he also received little children who wanted to be with him. They were eager to be received by him. Beloved, that's, that's gentleness. Without compromising courage and strength. And that's Christ-likeness. So, so we need some good definitions. We need to understand, well, what, is, what does this gentleness look like? How do we have both? How, how do we have the, the table-tossing courage to endure while remaining gentle and tender and offering relief, grace, being a servant? How do we have both? There's actually a really helpful definition here in our chapter on page 122. In that first paragraph towards the top, he says, Gentleness is an active trait, describing the manner in which we should treat others. It's care in action. It's, it's active character traits like humility, like compassion. It's those things put to work. But those things put to work always with right attitudes. One of the things we're going to talk about a little bit further in tonight is the reality that all of these things have to be held in tandem. They have to be held at the same time. So often we talk about there's always tensions. There's always two things that seemingly are, are pulling apart from one another. These things have to be held in tension. Like human responsibility and divine sovereignty, these things are held in tension. Here's the deal. So many of these things we... we Forget that not everything's in tension. Tension means that they're being pulled apart. Tandem just means they're being held together. We don't get to just say, well, I like this one, so I'll hold on to this one, but I can let go of that one for a while. No, no, all of these have to be held in tandem. One of the places that we're going to get to eventually is this idea of, is Titus. In Titus chapter 3, if you want to go ahead and turn there, that's where we're going to be spending a little bit of time this evening. And sometimes, and we'll, we'll open this further a little bit more 
sometimes it's helpful to understand or define a term in, in scripture by looking at how it's used with contrasts. In Titus chapter 3, we'll see this. Titus is this, this young pastor who's been dispatched by the apostle Paul to, to take matters in hands in these churches in Crete. And in chapter 3 verse 1, he, he's going to open up with, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. And then listen to the contrast that's about to take place here in verse 2. Titus chapter 3, verse 2. To malign no one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing consideration for all men. So he contrasts being peaceable and gentle with maligning. He said, if you're maligning, if you're speaking ill, or speaking evil of, that's what maligning means, if you're maligning, then you're not being gentle. And then he further defines that gentleness and that peaceableness by saying, and living, or excuse me, showing consideration for all men. So if you want to be gentle, that means that you are showing consideration for others. So remember, this is compassion, this is humility in action. The book, it, it mentions this, and we're going to consider some of the other places in Scripture. It demonstrates respect of others. It's careful with words. The, the book makes mention of this. Uh, I don't have it written down where here, but, but there it mentions the, the reality of gentleness doesn't just say, well, hey, you know, I, I just tell it like it is. Uh, you know, I, 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 see, I call them like I see them. This is just who I am. I, I'm just going to straight talk this way. Gentleness doesn't do that. But listen, this is where things are held in tandem. It still says the hard things. It still says the hard things, but it does so with a right consideration of hearing them. It says it from a place of humility. The heart that says, hey, I'm just going to say these things and, and kind of let them fall as they may, that's pride. That's not humility. That's not taking into consideration the here, that's, that's, not, that's walking in contradiction to passages like Ephesians chapter 4 that say that, that our words ought to give grace to the hearer. We ought to speak in such a way that our words communicate grace. In fact, there in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 2, gentleness and humility are, are directly connected the Apostle Paul says, he urges believers to show tolerance for one another with all humility and gentleness. In Colossians chapter 3, when he lists these traits of those who have been chosen by God, they're to put on humility, gentleness, and patience. One of the things that we've, we've tried to be careful to do as we've walked through this study on the fruitful life is, is talk about how none of these are negotiable. None of these are like, well, I really want to be faithful, but uh, sort of take it or leave it with gentleness. These are all interconnected. This isn't multiple choice. Because these are the characteristics of God and we're pursuing godliness, God-likeness, Christ-likeness, we don't get to opt out on this. We don't get to opt out and say, well, I just, that's, you know, I don't like that one. Again, Please don't understand gentleness is just always saying only, you know, sweet things, never saying hard things. Uh, Pastor Philip has mentioned a number of times his homiletics professor, who when they would go through and the, the students would be giving their, their sermons, the, the pastor that was going to critique them and was going to offer correction and say, hey, this has not been handled well, or hey, this delivery was not the way that it should have been. Um, you, you always knew how that critique was going to go when he opened with, all right, brother. Now, Proverbs says, fate for the wounds of a friend. Some of you who have been uh, in meetings with Pastor Philip and have had him open that way, maybe that's only, I don't know. Is it, nobody else is nodding. That might just be me. Nobody else? All right. But I've been in there. I've, I've had that meeting where he's just, all right. And he, I remember distinctly the first time it happened, he opened his Bible and said, now Proverbs says, and he read it, and I'm, oh no, I'd heard the story. 
I knew where this was going. But here's the deal. It, it doesn't negate, it doesn't preclude saying the hard things or coming down hard. Instead, it just makes sure that it's the appropriate way of doing it in the moment. Specifically for the hearer and not for you. I just had to get that off my chest. Again, where's the humility? Where's the consideration of others? Or is it just the consideration of, well, I just got so worked up. I got so angry. I got so fired up that I had to say that then, that way, that time to that person. Where was the, might have been a completely accurate thing to confront them on in a totally inappropriate way. Maybe they did need to have the hammer brought. But is it because you wanted to swing the hammer? Or because they needed to experience it? That's what gentleness takes into consideration. It, it has the full orb there. To be gentle, we've got to be humble and say, well, even though I want to act this way or say this thing, I, I'm not going to do that because I want to give grace to the hearer. I, I want to, I want to not wound because I'm mishandling my words. I'm mishandling my actions. And again, scripture is full of contrasts like this. A number of times, a number of times gentleness is being mentioned in the scripture. It, it's mentioned in contrast with other things. And I, one of my favorites is in 1 Corinthians in chapter 4, when, when Paul essentially warns them about, listen, I've heard that these things are coming and there needs to be repentance. You need to get these things brought into obedience. And, and he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 21, do you want me to come with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? And he's essentially saying, listen guys, help me do this right. Help me do this right. Because I can come with a rod. And, and by the way, the full picture of this, because we might hear this and say, oh, so there's a time for just the rod and no gentleness. Well, understand, Paul doesn't come at this time so that he doesn't act out of his own fulfillment of, I'd really like to bring the rod right now. Instead, and, and by the way, when he finally does come, and then when he writes another letter, and when he hears how that was all received, he says, you know, I know that some of y'all, this is the second Corinthians and I'm paraphrasing. I know that that was grievous to some of you, but I'm thankful. I know that was wounding. I know that was painful for some of you, but I trust that the Lord is going to work genuine repentance in this. Did Paul lay aside gentleness? Did Paul just for that season say that fruit of the Spirit is not going to be manifest in my life? No. Because again, these things have to do with taking all of them at the same time. In our correction, in our bringing the rod, it's still being done in consideration. It's still being done in gentleness. We don't really get to a point where you get to say, all right, enough being gentle. Because even biblically, even when Christ is pouring out wrath, it's not done without consideration of our frame. It's not done without consideration of mercy. It's not done in a sudden uncontrolled explosion. Instead, it's done with full consideration of our time, of our limitations. It's done in light of his perfect justice. All of these things are, again, meant to be held always in tandem. So even as we see here in 1 Corinthians, that even correction has to be done with gentleness. Or as we just looked at in Titus, it, it means at a minimum that we don't speak evil of others, but rather we show patience and consideration. We have to see the interconnectivity of all these. That, that it's done with humility. It's done with love. It's done with patience. 
one of the things that we've mentioned, if, if you go back and you listen through some of this series, one of the things that we'll talk about is how we're going to talk more about this one later when we get to. As we deal with patience, as we dealt with patience in this study in the Fruitful Life, one of the things that we talked about was, you know, this is, this is going to even connect to gentleness. Why? Because they're all related. Again, we don't get to negate, we don't get to neglect, we don't get to lay down one for the sake of the other. You know, I think, especially as we come into this season, we're celebrating Jesus coming. You know, we even sing songs like infant, lowly, infant, holy. You know, we talk about, you know, this meek and lowly beginning of Jesus in the manger. I'm really looking forward to one of the, one of the messages that Pastor Philip is going to bring, Lord willing, in the, in the next few weeks on Sunday morning, is a contrast between his first coming and his second coming. And how in one, Christ comes with little fanfare. He comes in a weakness. He comes as a suffering servant. Yet when he comes again, it will not be like that. And the contrast could not be more vivid, more severe. But think about the great display of gentleness of taking on flesh that we, that we celebrated this season. He considered our humble estate. He, he took into consideration our need and robed himself in weakness for our sake and his glory. Guys, we, we don't get to say, I want to be Christ-like, but I don't want to be gentle. But again, I, I, want, to, I want to put out another sort of caution here. <clears throat> Sometimes gentleness can be a mask. It can be a mask for other things. It, it could be a mask for, for cowardice. No, 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 I, I don't want to, I want to be gentle with them. It could just be fear of man. It could be, <clears throat> well, I, I don't want to confront them with this wickedness that's going on. I don't know that that would be gentle. No, remember, consideration, gen, excuse me, gen, gentleness is consideration. It's humility. It's laying aside of self for the benefit of the other. If someone is entrapped, entangled in sin, the very next chapter in Galatians is going to tell us, we go to them in gentleness. And that gentleness propels us to say, let me help get you untangled. Let me unwrap what's going on here. Let me expose the fact that you are in this trap. Let me bring this to your attention. Even though it's uncomfortable for me, it's good for you. It could be people pleasing. It could be a facade of, well, you know, I don't want people to think that I'm <clears throat> against anything or unhappy about something. It's remarkable when we consider the fullness of Scripture, the, the sort of pseudo Jesuses that can emerge. This idea of, well, you know, Jesus was just always this way. He was always warm and welcoming and he was always friendly and things like that. I think when I hear, I had someone bring that up to me recently. Aren't, aren't Christians supposed to always just be warm and friendly and inviting and nice and, and smiling? And I couldn't help it but take them to Jesus' woes to the Pharisees. Now here's the deal. Was he being ungentle then? No. He was acting completely consistent with the rest of his character. He was doing exactly what was right. On the flip side, the Pharisees, you read consistently through the Gospels, one of the things that the Pharisees were continuously fearful of was losing the people's favor because they loved the praise of men, because they loved the position of honor that they had. They didn't want to deal truthfully. They didn't want to deal. So in their desire to be pleasing to people, have the praise of people, they absolutely are not gentle towards them and allow them to be, as Jesus says, twice the children of hell. 
How gentle is that? One of the other masks that I think gentleness can, can sort of be slapped on as <clears throat> is a lack of conviction. I don't really know what I think about that. I'm not really sure. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to land too hard on that. So, listen, we ought not, we ought not hold convictions without a biblical basis, but we ought not be satisfied to not hold convictions. There ought to be a desire to say, I've been taught this, but I want to own it. I, I want to study diligently and say, what does God's word say about this? So that I can say, I've been, I've heard this my whole life. I've been taught this faithfully in church. I, I, maybe I haven't heard this my whole life, but when I came here, I was taught this. What, what you, we don't want to have is people who say, well, you know, my pastor says. Rather, we want to have people that say, thus says the Lord. And we're still, still able to say that in gentleness. Sometimes that can just be laziness. I don't like conflict. I don't want to do that. It's just, I'll just deal gently with it. It'll create more work if I bring that. In a desire to please ourselves, we don't consider others. We don't serve others. And 1 Peter serves as a guardrail for that. 1 Peter 3 <clears throat> tells us that we're to sanctify. First Peter 3 tells us we're to sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you for the, to give an account for the hope that is in you. Now most of us know that. Most of us know that verse. Most of us know that section. We need to always be ready. We need to be prepared to give an answer. We need to be ready to give an account for the hope that lies within us. That's good and that's true and that's right. And again, we don't get to negate that and say, well, but I want to be gentle and if they ask me about this, I'm going to have to say that. So I guess gentleness goes out the window. No. L look at what the rest of that verse says. Yet, with gentleness and reverence. You're giving an account for the hope that lies within you, but you're doing it with gentleness. Listen, be bold. Be ready. Hold out in these things. Don't use the truth as a truncheon. Don't, don't use the truth as a weapon and say, well, I, I've got to be bold. I've got to get, be ready. Somebody said something that was contrary to truth. I'm locked and loaded. I'm ready to go. Yet with gentleness and reverence. Listen, it might be time to break out the truth hammer. But it has to be done in consideration of their soul's state, not your worked upness. It's got to be done because it has to be yielded, wielded with, with humble consideration for their soul, not for, oh, I just learned this. I can't wait to hit them with it. We're to be ready to give an account for the hope that lies within us with gentleness. Let it be a word fitly spoken. But let it be a word spoken in the right season, in the right spirit, not for your sake. Well, if I don't speak up, they're going to think. Remember we talked about people pleasing? Are you doing it in consideration for them or for you? Maybe it's that family member that just continually is picking. Maybe it's because that family member who's always mocking. No, well, I'm just, I'm going I'm to really let them have it. I've been watching all these apologetics videos. I've been reading all these books. I, I know the answer to this. And so the next time he mentions that thing, I'm going to go after them. Th this family member, they're, they're involved in this false church. And I can tell them everything wrong and false about that church. Yay, you? Did you surrender gentleness on the way? Beloved, it's held in tandem. Not because we want to show how insufficient or foolish their worldview is. But it's awful. Yeah. It's awful that they are entrapped in that sin. 
And it would be awful of us to disobey the commands of God and the demonstration of the fruit of the Spirit and rebuking their falsehood. We have to do both. We have to do both for the sake of the witness of the one that we're proclaiming. Because anybody can get fed up with somebody else's viewpoint. Anybody can become stock loaded with facts and rebuttals. But only somebody spirit, filled with the Spirit of God can address falsehood unflinchingly with gentleness. With a God wrought heart that is taken into consideration their condition and our own. Remember, this flows out of humility. And the chapter in our book here, it, it offers some guidance on how this might look in our life. But honestly, one of, the, one of the things I want us to consider there carefully, one of the elements that it mentions, he, he says on page 128, uh, I fear that all too often we Christians may be less humane. He, he's dealing with examples of how we might show uh, gentleness. And there at, the, at the, top, the second paragraph at the top of page 128, he says, I fear that all too often, we Christians may be less humane and considerate than non-believers. I struggle with that. If we're believers, these fruit ought to be, that has to be cultivated. But we get in a dangerous situation when we start saying, hey, these, these Christians, I, I, see un, I see unbelievers acting better, more Christ-like than these Christians. There's a struggle there. But he goes on to say a little bit further on, he says, do we appear to be rigid, unyielding, and inflexible, or do we come across as genial, reasonable, and humane in our relationships with other people? Beloved, truth is inflexible. It's rigid. We will appear rigid and unyielding if we take our stand on the truth. We will appear that way at times. But we should appear that way because of our holding fast to the truth, not because of our lack of gentleness. That doesn't mean that we're to be inconsiderate of how the truth is being expressed. I think that's what John calls telling the truth and loving it, not telling the truth in love. What we do have to hold in tandem is that we declare the truth definitively without apology, without negotiation. We, we don't change the proclamation or, or the truth that we're proclaiming because it seems too rigid. Rather, we guard against our flesh's tendency to be inconsiderate or uncompassionate because we have the truth. Which again, trace that one back. It's pride. If we look at this and say, I've got the truth and they don't have it. And so I'm just, I've got to, I've got to unleash both barrels at once. Now, I've got to do that. Is it done out of love? Is it done out of consideration and humility or just, I've got to be right? That's where, again, we have to get our definition of gentleness from the scripture and not from the world. If you take a stand on something and say, no, that's wrong. The world will call that ungentle or rigid or inflexible or rude or whatever all day long. It's not what the Bible says. Again, this is the full-orbed understanding of these things. So again, I told you we're going to kind of bookend this. Go back with me to Titus chapter 3. I love this section. It's, it's a really brief vignette of the gospel. <clears throat> it's sort of a Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 in, in miniature. Because Paul tells Titus, remind them, re remind them of these things. Make sure they remember all of this. And he says, beginning in verse 1, which we've already read this evening, remind them to be subject to rulers 
to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Why? Why should that be the fruit of our life? Why should, rather than being malignant in our speech, filled with hatred, inconsiderate, those who are dedicated to strife, why should we rather be peaceable, gentle, showing consideration? 4, verse 3, we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Why should we cultivate these things? Because we've been saved, beloved. Because of everything that verses 4 through 7 tell us. What we have to guard against here, again, and in the cultivation of all these traits, we have to guard against our natural disposition, our, our natural inclination. Beloved, we're, we're being renewed into the image of the Son, and we await final transformation. Philippians, uh, Philippians 3, the end of chapter 3 deals with that. We await the transformation that will come at the return of our Savior. We're longing for it. First John chapter 3 in the first few verses deals with that. It, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but when we see him, we shall be like him. Therefore, everyone who has this hope within him purifies himself even as he is pure. In other words, it's not enough to say, well, you know, I'm just, I'm naturally sensitive so that this one is easy. Beloved, your natural gentleness is not what this means. If, on the same token, we can't say, well, I'm just naturally gruff and, you know, I'm, I'm this way, so I am who I am. Or think that we can major on or minor on one of these. Well, I'm just naturally a tender-hearted person, so I have gentleness in the bag. Not necessarily. But we're talking about something that is ours supernaturally in the Lord. That stems from, that results from our redemption. That we are no longer to live as citizens of this world because our citizenship is in heaven. Therefore we pursue the things that are pleasing to him. One of the final sections in this chapter, he talks about the idea of seeking a gentle spirit. And he makes mention of this, the fact several different ways, several different times. He says, we ought to seek for this trait. Very often it is, and I think he opens the chapter in this way too to some extent, uh, that gentleness is probably not a, a, a trait often that you're considering in the life, your prayer life maybe, or in your pursuit of godliness that you're going, I just want to become so much more gentle. Through my study and my preparation of this, that was exposed. Do I long for gentleness? Well, as it's understood biblically, yeah. But I have to have that biblical understanding. Do I long for it the way that I ought to? Certainly not. But listen, I, I cannot be supernaturally gentle. I cannot have the gentleness of God our Savior apart from the work of Christ in our heart. So, so how can I stir that up? How can I cultivate? Because that's one of the things that we're talking about with all this is that these things have to be cultivated. They have to be turned up. They have to be fed. They have to be, they have to be uh, uh, dug under. They have to get all of the nutrients. So how do we do that? Well, at a minimum, we have to know about them. 
Congratulations, step one complete. You're here. You, you've heard about it. You know at least that this needs to be a facet of our pursuit of righteousness. And now we begin to work. Please, we, we, we went through this with the, uh, the study through expository listening. Please don't think that just because you've heard this that now you're going to be more gentle. That you're going to have just by osmosis of sitting here this evening, you're going to walk out of here a more gentle Christian. Because I guarantee, I know, because I, little, little uh, story here. Last night, I sit down, um, it's late, it's kind of the middle of the night, sit down to begin uh, typing up all of my notes here, getting all of this together. And one of my kids wakes up and starts crying and has, has a bellyache, comes out, it's late, I'm tired, I have work to do. And all I can think is, now we get to practice. I've got to be gentle with my child who's coming out. I'm not sure if they're sleepwalking. I'm not sure if they really are crying or if they just want to, you know, go and sleep in my bed. My study of this does not automatically make me gentle. Our hearing of this does not automatically make us gentle. There will be many among us this evening who, on our way out of the parking lot, will have a first test to gentleness. <laughs> there will be many of us who, as we get our children next door, our gentleness will be tested. As we have these conversations at work, as we go throughout our week, as we have our regular interactions. And by the way, we might do well, really, really well for a week or two. And then we might need to be reminded. We will need to be refreshed, which is, by the way, why a steady study of the scriptures is so critical that we would continually have these things be brought to our remembrance. One of my favorite statements from the epistles is, is where Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1, he talks about, I, I, it's been revealed to me, I'm soon to depart, but I don't mind repeating these things. And while I'm still here, I'm going to repeat them again. He essentially says, we need to hear it over and over and over again. Sunday's message on thankfulness, Sunday morning from Pastor Philip, let's just put that one on repeat. Might be going, but I'm nailing that one right now, right now. Listen, we always are in need of cultivating these fruit. We always are going to, so we need to continually be resupplying. We need to continually be turning up the soil of our heart and digging out the weeds and digging out the distracting desires and the fleshly patterns and the rocks that would choke out maturity of growth in these things. We need to continually be feeding these things, having others come in. And would you look at, by, by the way, at the back of your book, there's study questions. I don't know if you noticed this. Um, there's study questions in the back of this that you could grab somebody this evening and say, hey, um, to what degree do you see gentleness, or excuse me, on, on a scale of zero to five, rate yourself on the following qualities, then ask a friend to rate you. I'm going to talk about cultivating humility. Go to your spouse this evening and say, am I sensitive to other people's rights and feelings? Beloved, we have to work. But we work. We work with the comfort, the assurance that Christ is working in us to enable us to bring to completion, to fruition, to fulfillment what he has begun in us. None of us ought to be satisfied with our status of sanctification. I, I, I am so encouraged by Paul's statement of, I have not yet attained, but I press on. I, I lay aside, I reach forward, I strain forward, but I, I press on. Beloved, we're all there. And one of the beauties of the body is that we are there together, not competing with one another, but pulling along and, hey, come with me. How are you doing? 
I, I saw that rock there. Let's let's dig it up in gentleness, so that we would be more Christ-like. Will you pray with me, Heavenly Father? We're th- we're such a needy people, and we're so richly blessed that you have provided for us your word, you have provided for us your spirit, you have provided your body, your bride, your people, that we would build one another up, that we would exhort one another, that we would encourage one another, that we would pursue righteousness together, that we would pursue the cultivation of gentleness and joy and peace and love, and long-suffering, all all of these, that we would pursue them for your namesake. That it would be clear that the power doesn't come from us, but comes from God. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, for his glory. Amen.